for a little while I thought about doing videos about like self-help type stuff. Uh, this is like a long time ago. And then I realized it's like a year ago. I realized that more than a year ago, it was just like, I so don't have myself figured out enough to be giving advice to people. And one of the things they're whole, they're YouTubers who just, their whole brand is giving advice, but I've, I've met enough of them that they, a lot of them are people who don't follow their advice. And I am someone who still have like a long way to go following advice. Hi, Brazil. Um, oh my God, people are here. So like, I never felt comfortable giving advice, but it's funny because people ask me for advice on like life stuff. It's like, I can give you advice on writing, but is this guy really the guy you want advice on life stuff or God forbid relationships? Like I'm not that guy. That's I'll never like, I don't think I'll be that guy ever. Yeah, you're still a mod, Riley. Talk about doom. Should I just, fuck it. Should I just get right into talking about doom and not look at the chat at all and just fucking go deep? I'm so, I'm learning how to stream. I'm getting more confident in how to stream. Uh, I, how do I, okay. Can you be a mod too? Yeah, Joe, you can be a mod. Hold on. Everybody's gonna be a mod in the Max Landis streams. No rules. Uh, the American Ultra sequel. Yeah, let's talk about International Ultra, my fanfic for my own movie that didn't was not a success. <laughs> Although I really like American Ultra. I got the poster over there. It's all little. <laughs> I, uh, I really like Ultra. International Ultra was really fucking cool. Phoebe and Mike uh, at the top of the movie basically go rogue. Phoebe goes to Mike and says to him, like, I get we're secret agents now, but this isn't what I wanted. Literally, I left the CIA to be with you and live a normal life, and now we got pushed back in. Mike, because he's, you know, kind of, he just loves Phoebe so much and wants to do what's right by her, goes rogue, becomes a traitor to the United States, and they disappear after the first 10 minutes. <laughs> They're gone from the movie for like 15 minutes <laughs> because now we follow every all the characters in the CIA as a new villain uh, named Honcho, who I absolutely loved, who is a hypnotist who works with the mind, shows up at the Pentagon holding a green card. And as he holds the green card, everyone lets him through deeper and deeper and deeper into the Pentagon. And then he holds up a red card and the guards just are like, yes, sir, like that. And they let him in and he gets the nuclear football, the copy of the device with all of the American nuke codes that America has, and he leaves. The CIA tries to catch him at the airport. Blue card, green triangle. The CIA are now his bodyguards. It turns out that this guy worked for the CIA for 20 years. It's like Paul Giamatti. But in that time, he did one of the craziest things ever, which is he put post-hypnotic suggestions into almost every high-level person in the CIA and the Pentagon and the Navy and the military because he got access to all of them. So with a series of cards, he can snap mind control on anyone, basically all the way up to the president and maybe even the president. But you know who wasn't in the CIA when he was doing this? Phoebe Larson. She left to be with Mike. So Mike and Phoebe are forced to come back. And now it's Mike and Phoebe as outsiders. And it's a total romantic adventure. Uh, I love the romance in American Ultra. There was a lot more romance in the script, but uh, some of it got cut for the movie. It's on the cutting room floor, but I felt it was still a pretty romantic movie, but it's just like fucking like, yeah, that's true. The whole I'm the tree, you're the car thing. Uh, is directly from the script. Uh, but a lot of American Ultra is directly from the script. It was a little more violent than I, I don't, I don't know. I like American Ultra. But no, so International Ultra is them versus uh, Honcho. And Honcho, all of Honcho's, all of the good guys from the first movie are now bad guys. And then we find out midway through the movie, we need someone else who who's, hasn't been mind wiped. Laugher. He survived the first movie, if you remember that. Uh, and <laughs> Laffer, uh, they go to him and he's missing his teeth. He has gold teeth. And they recruit him. And it's Mike, Laffer, and Phoebe versus the CIA and Honcho. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. I thought it was a pretty cool sequel. 
Yeah, that was International Ultra. Um, okay, what's next? Yeah, Terra Obscura is extremely different from my normal stuff because I wrote it as a tent pole movie. I wrote it as like The Rock or like any of those movies, you know, that have a bunch of top loaded with exposition. And then they go to a place and there's a bunch of action. Aliens is like that. Although Aliens has a good 30 minute break in the middle of it from the action. Um, yeah, it, 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 uh, American Ultra is not something I would put out there as like an example of me being like a good like between the between the lines Max Landis good writer thing. It's just like a very like pop script. What did I eat for breakfast? I haven't eaten anything for breakfast right now, but right now I'm on a meal plan because I got really into CrossFit. So I have big boxes of food delivered to my house for $200 a week. And then I don't spend any money on any other food. And I just eat these little microwave meal plans. Hi, Australia. I had great time when I was in Australia. At the top of last year, when I was extremely unhappy and depressed, I ended up in Australia with one of my best friends and then ended up on a farm, don't even get me started, of a family friend, which was like a therapy farm, kind of, for two months, just doing farm stuff in Australia. It was like, truly, what a time to be alive. Uh, what's everyone saying? Is that Evolve or a different meal plan? I'm on Nutrition Systems, which I heard about from Seamus from the WWE. Writing prompts to the audience in these live streams. Hmm. Hmm. Well, Benjamin, right now, my preferred platform is this. I always look for stuff to do on these because I'm not a YouTuber. You know, I'm not like, I don't have the like snaps of someone like a pyrocynical or like, uh, what, not pyrocynical. I don't care about pyrocynical. Who's the guy? Penguin Zero. That guy. I love how like dry he is and how able to roll with anything he is. He's a great host. And I'm just not that. I'm just like, <laughs> do I have an opinion of the Save the Cat essay? Um, the Save the Cat book? Yeah, I have an opinion on all screenwriting books, which is that ultimately they can only teach you formats and tricks. And they won't actually teach you to be a good writer or how to be successful. And I think if, if you're like nervous about that, uh, am I still on Reddit? I posted there the other day for the first time in a long time. No one cared. Why? Like, I was so afraid. I normally post on Reddit under a pseudonym. That's the only place in my life I use a pseudonym. But I posted from my main account and no one gave a shit. No one gave a shit. I was like, oh, okay. That's what I thought. I mean, I like, I'm not famous. So like I suspected that no one would care, but um, I was really, I was delighted. I was delighted. What was the initial impulse to write Trust the Police? I wanted to write a movie about three conversations and I wanted the first conversation, the second conversation to be about the first conversation and the third conversation to be about the second conversation. So, and I knew that I only wanted two people in the first two conversations. And then in the third conversation, I wanted more people and lots of people as like a wrap up. And I wanted to do it as tight as possible. And I wanted to direct it. And what I wanted to do was essentially do a crime thriller that happens after the crime thriller. So I didn't want to show flashbacks. I didn't want to go back in time. I wanted it to be all in performance. It's not a pop movie. It's not a blockbuster movie. It's something you like put on, you see on streaming because it has a good picture. And then you watch it and you go, great performances. And you know, in 1999, this would have been like a Sundance movie, but that doesn't really exist anymore. Sundance doesn't take you to theaters. It takes you to streaming. And guess what? Everyone else is going to streaming too. I mean, streaming especially in the age of the coronavirus, like what is even going to happen to the movie industry? Theaters can't stay closed for eight months. Theaters were already losing money. The big studios, some of them were losing money. The ones that aren't owned by mega conglomerates. I mean, Warner Brothers will be okay. Disney will be okay. Universal will be okay. But what about Lionsgate? What about everybody else? I mean, it's going to be a dry, dry, dry season and residuals go down, you know? What image led me to write Decon? I'll get into Decon and Trust the Police later. Um, but uh, with the image that led me to write, write Decon was actually an idea, uh, which was, I, I heard a really horrific story about uh, a virgin sacrifice. And I was like, I can't believe, I can't believe 
I'm an atheist. I'm not even agnostic. I think there are probably things we don't understand that are like God, but I don't think they had a hand in creating this earth. I'm not even like a spiritual person. I think all everything comes from meat. All of the incredible things you have from meditation, I think come from your meat. I think psychedelics access different parts of the meat computer. I don't believe in God, but when I heard about this virgin sacrifice, all I could think was like some people on this planet, a lot of people on this planet go through their whole lives trying to score points for an imaginary afterlife and they're willing to kill other people for it. And they torture themselves and torture other people for nothing. And I was like, God, that got me really interested. I was like, it's crazy. Some girl, some little girl gets killed for no reason just because they think Gandalf wants her. They have an imaginary Obi-Wan Kenobi. They're, they're basically LARPing their religion, except for they really kill someone. And I was like, that's fucking, it like hit me harder. I know that's like such a 14, like 14 year old, like Nietzsche, God doesn't exist. Philosophy, philosophy. But for me, the, the story about this girl being sacrificed really upset me. And so I got really into the history of exorcisms and I found out more because I was like, that's a thing that people really do that's based on nothing. And I found out more and more of exorcisms were mental illness, were essentially priests and shamans torturing people with mental illness. And I was like, that, that's so interesting. Is there a movie there? And then I was like, yeah, that movie already exists. The Exorcism of Emily Rose is kind of like that. And I'm sure there's like better movies than that, that are more like real films about like how fucked up it is and not just fun, scary movies. But I was like, what could, what could I do with this? Do I want to write a movie about a mentally ill person being tortured by priests? No, I don't want to write that movie. And then I thought that virgin sacrifice, I was like, virginity is such a sexist concept, the way it's played out in our culture. And the idea that being a virgin makes you special or pure is totally made up. And then I was like, what if all these crazy concepts had a basis in medical science? What if, okay, what if being possessed by a demon was just like a rare tropical disease. Cause I had just watched this video, this uh, Chris Gazat video on tropical diseases that I found really, really interesting. And I was like, oh, tropical diseases, exorcisms are bad. Whoa. And I was just, I like, I started writing decon that night. Cause I was like, oh cool. And you know, I love writing. I love writing excellence. Uh, I love writing. Thank you. I like my new hair too. I like, it's so weird. You know, man, I look back at like videos and pictures of myself and like, I don't even like fully know that guy. Like it, uh, maybe you have that feeling too. I like know him too well. I don't want to meet him again. I see pictures of blonde Max Landis. I'm like, it's like, it's like Dorian Gray looking at his portrait. What about my acting career? There will never be one because I am not good at acting. I am only good at talking at as Max Landis. And a lot of people think I'm not even good at that. So no, can conscious, excuse me. I have like the burps and the sniffles. I've like been eating like shit. Did you notice uh, movie villains? Did you notice and have opinions on movie villains being extreme environmentalists? Hobbs and Shaw, Godzilla 2, Aquaman. No, that's really interesting. And that's a good observation, man. Like, excellent, good observation. It's interesting. There's been a lot of, like, environmentalists are bad, kind of, or, like, people, liberals are bad, has been, has been, I have, like, I'm sorry, I'm, like, picking my nose. Um, I think Sony will survive. Uh, but... There's been a lot of like liberals are bad, but like subtle liberals are bad and more subtle liberal ideas are bad. And I go one level above that and say subtle humanist ideas are bad. There's been a lot of transhumanism in movies. What spec got you representation from writ large? No spec got me representation from writ, writ large because the person who created writ large, Britton Rizzio, helped, I helped create it kind of, not really. But I was like one of her main clients, if not her main client, when she left Circle of Confusion. And the script that got me representation at Circle of Confusion was a script called Hometown Hero that is 
a bad script that has like eight great things in it that I'm very proud of and that I've taken and put into other things because Hometown Hero is not great. Uh, but the people who read it, Dave Alpert and Britton Rizzio, were like, oh, there's stuff in here. And then the script that sort of got me hot was a script called Good Time Gang. And then I'm like touching my face so much. I'm like wiping my eyes and picking my nose. I'm not good at streaming, guys. You smile literally all the time. Have you always been so smiley? Honestly, I don't smile all the time. I'm very animated and people have always told me that. And I think I'm smiling a lot today because I'm in a good mood because I saw my friend the other day and I was talking to my friends this morning, but you know, quarantine, I wrote a play, quarantine's driving me nuts. I've been in 15 days and uh, you know, it should be easy, but, but I, sorry, I'm getting very scrambled. Do I smile all the time? I used to be afraid to smile. And when I would smile in pictures, I would smile like this. And then finally I learned that you smile with your upper teeth. And once I learned that, I feel excited a lot of the time. Some people have called it manic. It's not, it's hypomanic. It's a little under. I feel excited a lot of the time when I'm not depressed. Uh, wow, people in here really attacking Knives Out. Don't attack Knives Out. Knives Out is, Knives Out is fun. Knives Out is like a fun murder mystery. Don't be a hater on Knives Out. It wasn't fucking terrible. It's like fine. Knives Out is fine. What do you want? <laughs> what do you, you're not going to get Brick twice. Like Brick is a special movie. If you haven't seen the director's film Brick, that movie is, that was when Joseph Gordon-Levitt was like, it felt like he was going to be a big star any second. And it only sort of happened. I love Joseph Gordon-Levitt. That whole era, he was a good actor. Uh, tell me the straight shit about Knives Out. What was I talking about? You guys, I was being so focused and good. And then someone was like, you smile too much. Oh God. What do I talk about next? Let me re reorient me. I saw someone ask about tra Ted Tragic, a script I wrote that is not great, but again, has very cool things in it. It has a good hero. The hero of the movie, Ted Tragic is a movie about an agency, uh, a United States government agency that's very underfunded and only has a couple of agents. And the agent's job is if someone creates, if an independent inventor outside of a corporation creates a device that's marked as level A, a level A invention, their job is to go and intercede with that inventor before they become a James Bond style supervillain. So it's essentially these agents are sent, they get notified, someone has created a laser gun, someone has created a jetpack, and before they can go like, I've gone out of control with power, if they don't try to patent it within the first 60 days, this agent shows up and goes, hey, I'm from the United States government, and we can either buy this patent and you can never use it again, or we have to kill you. Sorry, we've had bad experiences with this in the past. So the hero of Ted Tragic is kind of Ted Tragic, the, the agent. And it's also kind of, I forget her name. Oh, I loved her. She's a woman who invents an anti-gravity device. This like nerdy bullied woman who hates her job. And then she invents an anti, it's will control the states of matter. So it can create radiation. It can turn off, uh, Gravity, it can do so many cool things. And she slowly starts to turn into a supervillain. And Ted Tragic has to intervene. And it was pretty cool. Uh, what else? Bill Murray in his prime for Ted Tragic. Yeah, or Chevy Chase in his prime. Ted Tragic was an interesting character. He was fun to write. He's different from what I usually do. What does Mr. Gallium look like? Whatever great actress we can get. You know, I think of her as late 30s, early 40s. What happened with Deeper? I don't know, ask MGM. Um, did you ever write scripts for Dirk Gently season three? Um, no, I wrote a bunch of scripts of, of pieces of scripts for it because I knew what happened in Dirk three, four, and five, if we ever got there, but we never got there. So whoops, wrestling isn't wrestling sequel. I would need a lot of people which you can't do during coronavirus. And also I feel like a lot of those people aren't interested in doing things for me for free anymore. Uh, are you gonna release higher? Yes, uh, I think I'm gonna. Although 
Jessica Chastain would have been incredible. Topless woman in hire. Excuse, excuse me. Do not call Polly fucking Weber a Nobel Prize recipient and fucking Time Magazine cover and basically the Niels deGrasse Tyson of physics. Do not call her topless woman just because she appears without a top briefly in the movie. She is fucking a genius. Call her Dr. Weber. Thank you. Sorry. Love Exposure. Love Exposure is the best movie ever made. People always ask me, like, what's the best movie ever made? Love Exposure is. Why is it the best movie ever made? Because it's four hours long and it feels like it's an hour and a half and it's funny the whole time. What other movie can you possibly say that about? It's a comedy. It's not some like Japanese art film that's four hours long. It's a fucking comedy that's funny for four and a half hours and it's romantic. Do I still talk to the red letter media guys? Yeah, Mike. Um, any stories about movie fights? They were fun. Those guys, you know, those guys were very like tough, you know, not tough. They were nice, Spencer and all them. Like even, you know, Andy and Mike and all those guys were like sweet. They're just sweet, nerdy guys, but they took it very seriously. And I think when I was on movie fights, I would take it not as seriously. And I would come in with like a lot of goofy energy. And they, at the time I had a very... I had a way of speaking that could steamroll people. And uh, I uh, I steamrolled people. I would, I during kind of funny, I would like, I would interrupt, pe not kind of funny, uh, movie fights, I would like in interrupt people. And like, I wish I hadn't as much. Watching some of them back makes me like cringe a little. Watching a lot of me back makes me cringe. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah, me losing movie fights was ridiculous. I'm still sour about that. I really believe I should have won every time I was on. But but now it sounds like sour grapes. I'm like bitter. Ooh, my career in movie fights. Uh, hey, I'm the guy from India who asked a question with a video. Just want to say sorry to know that you are not angry. Uh, I don't need a Chronicle 2 pitch. You can read Chronicle 2. It's online. Let's not talk about fucking Chronicle. Old shit. Old shit. All this is old shit. The new shit is I'm a streamer who doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> That's my rebrand. Tell the Daily Mail. I'm a streamer who doesn't know how to stream and is just doing this because I'm so bored. Guys, are you all bored? How's everyone's... Before we get into Doom, how's everyone's... Uh, how's everyone's mental health? I want to check in. So this will be boring to watch for a second, but I, I've been thinking about people and this is like an instant way to get mental health. Is everyone in quarantine? Don't just write like a sentence. Just, uh, just like write what you, how you're doing, please. Yeah, good. You want to be productive, but you're depressed. Yeah, same. I'm not depressed. I just feel like I don't know where the future is going to be in one week, two weeks. Looks like everyone's good. Everything is perfectly normal here. Jere Riegers, where are you? Where are you where it's normal? I'm getting on a flight. Oh, my God. Terrible stuck in a cramped studio apartment. I'm sorry if this is boring to watch. I'm just reading how all my... People are doing. Yeah, it's interesting. You know what's... <laughs> my penis is in quarantine because my girl has her period. <laughs> you know what's interesting, guys, is everything you guys are saying are all ways I've felt during quarantine. I felt bored, but okay. I felt more productive. I felt less productive and unable to be productive. I felt scared of the future. I'm suddenly outside all the time. I, like, take walks and runs now, which is something I never did. It's, I, I mean, like, it's both a very useful break psychologically, but you have to keep in mind, I was already canceled, so I was in quarantine anyway, pretty much, you know, other than my friends. I wasn't, like, going out. I'd go on, like, weird Max adventures, but, like, you know, I, I uh, she was really excited for those. Jesus. Wait, I want to know, the one guy said, one guy said, so many people are loving the time alone. Do you think pandemic films will be blacklisted by studios? 
What an interesting question. I One of the things that's interesting right now is so many people are saying like, I have an idea for a pandemic movie. My friend, uh, one of my friends, Master of Cum on Instagram, he's a great meme account, but he, uh, he posted like, no one wants to read your quarantine script. No one wants to read your quarantine script. And he said it as a joke, but I really, for me, I'm like, what does a quarantine script even look like right now? We don't know how quarantine ends. So if you created an idea based off this environment right now, it would be like making a World War II movie during World War II, which I don't think there were a lot of other than like promotional stuff. I keep picking my nose. Oh God, loving isolation. <laughs> Can't stay long. My wife's relatives from Florida are coming over for dinner. That makes me sound like I'm like your illicit girlfriend sneak in here with Max Landis. Okay, guys. Wait, you're in a hospital? Chiro, why are you in a hospital? You're not quarantined and you're in a hospital? I was a hypochondriac for many years. I also didn't eat fish and I was a terrible boyfriend. Uh, I, I also had all sorts of weird rules. I never did drugs. I was like very insistent about not doing drugs till I was 27. Um, now I don't know how I would have survived quarantine so far without weed, but weed puts you into this, like, it already feels like you don't know what time of day it is during quarantine and you don't know what day of the week it is. But now it's like with plus weed, you're like in a warp. You all know something funny for years. I thought weed didn't affect me. And I would tell people weed doesn't affect me. And I would smoke a joint because I didn't know how to smoke weed. I would smoke and take it in my mouth and then blow it out. And I didn't know you had to like inhale it. So I would be hanging out with people and I don't know, I'm not high. And everyone around me would be so high. Who's the hottest girl on the planet? Angela Merkel. Um, book re recommendation. Uh, did you date comic book girl 19, Donica? Donica and I are very close, but we did not date. Um, it's a great Tinder profile. You smoke like a French guy. I do everything like a French guy. Uh, geez, Louise. Okay, let's get back into it. Let's fucking do it. Doom Eternal. So Doom always had like the simplest idea for a video game ever. It was one of the first, if not the first, first person shooter property. If you're not counting Wolfenstein, who I believe was made by the same people. But basically Doom is on Mars. They find an energy thing and they tap into the energy wavelength and it blows up and it turns out that energy wavelength was hell. And it's like, oh no, the demons are coming onto Mars and it's a demons on Mars thing. And you're the one person who's like shooting through them. You're the Marine. Okay, no. So in the new fucking doom, I'm losing viewers. Like people are leaving now that I'm finally talking about something. So in the new fucking doom, there is one of the most creative, coolest takes on Judeo-Christian mythology I've ever seen. And while I was playing it, because Doom, you have to understand, if you don't play Doom, when you're playing Doom, you're in it. You're basically jacked into the Matrix because it's a fast twitch shooter. Like, it's basically like, they describe it as combat chess. And at first, it doesn't feel that way. It just feels like monster, 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 monster. No, I'm not high now. Monster, 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 monster. You're like overwhelmed. You're shooting shotgun. You're firing machine gun. You're shooting a laser gun. You're swinging chainsaw. And you're very like focused in. And the story kind of happens in the background. It also doesn't help that Doom, especially Doom Eternal, is very samey visually. That's sort of my one big criticism of the game. Like is that it? it you're never under a blue sky. Every environment you're in, is either a ruin of some kind with a red sky, a castle with a blue sky, hell, or one final place. And I wanted to talk about the final place because that's the thing this game adds. So spoilers for Doom Eternal. And I'm just gonna talk about Doom Eternal and how fucking cool and amazing and genius the central idea of Doom Eternal is, which you only get if you read in the lore. You know how video games always give you all these like lore things to read and some of them don't even have audio components and it's just like, 
how the fuck am I gonna read off my TV screen scrolling with a PlayStation controller? Fuck this shit. Except I read every single page of the Doom Eternal lore because there's nothing in the game to tell you what the fuck is going on. It's just demons flying at you and you swinging a sword and a chainsaw trying to keep them away from you. So Doom Eternal has them, I'm just resetting. It's almost like, cause I don't know how to talk to a camera without editing. I keep resetting because I've trained myself to do that from talking to a camera over the years for, okay, so here we go. So, a long, long time ago, there was a place called Argent. Argent was a, I just have to like pick my nose because I keep going like this or like that. I just have to like pick my nose. So if you'll excuse me. Okay. Okay. How do I join the color society? Color society don't exist no more, bro. It never really did. It was just like a loose group of my friends. It was a name I put on Facebook events. Uh, Dario Argento. Great. Okay, so. I am going to talk about Doom. So a long, long time ago, there was a place called Argent. Argent was like a medieval kingdom. And it was an alternate dimension that was like kind of medieval and kind of gothic, but incredibly beautiful. And they lived in peace. They have these special warriors who were like their most elite warriors. And one day a guy showed up. He was a human. Now the Argent, the Argentine or however they are called people, they're not human specifically. And they all worship these things called the wraiths, which are like these powerful godlike beings. And that's how it works in this alternate dimension until this human shows up. He's all beat up and fucked up. And he's like, rip and tear, rip and tear, kill. That's you. That's Doom Guy. So he gets brought in to the Argent and trained as their greatest warrior, even though he's an outsider. They train him to be this incredible warrior. Around the same time, the Argent people are opening alternate dimension gates using the wraiths. And they end up opening an alternate dimension gate to this place called Erdak. Erdak is heaven. For lack of a better word, it's heaven. It's an alternate dimension. So it's not like you don't go there when you die, but it's these super advanced cybernetic aliens who are part organic, part alien. They kind of look like angels, not really. But they're like gods and their technology is way better than Argent. So they ally with them. The wraiths, these, the old gods of the Argent universe kind of fall back, go to sleep. Or the, no, they're still helping the warriors. God, no editing. I'm trying to pitch you doom. Okay, so uh, are are we ready? Are we are we with it? Are we caught up? So this uh, this is Doom, <laughs> Doom Eternal. I'm pitching you Doom Eternal. So these Erdak, these people from Erdak who are called the Makir, they're like gods basically and angels, and they are now give all their technology to the Argent people. And now in Argent, when you die, you don't have to die. You can go into this machine and it processes your soul and then your soul goes up to Erdak. So when you die, instead of just dying, you go to this alternate heaven dimension, almost like they just accidentally created an afterlife with technology. Already, this is an incredibly creative idea. The idea that heaven and immortal realm existed independently of each other and then met through technology, but it gets better. It gets fucking better. Yeah, ignore, I hate when I, people are like the stupid fantasy names. I know Argent, Erdak, and the Dilithium Crystal. It's so nerdy. But let me keep talking about Doom because I'm fucking vibing right now on Doom. Okay, so the Argent and the Erdak live in peace for a zillion years. They're like friends and the Slayer kills lots of the enemies of Argent. And then one day they find another gate to another dimension. And in this dimension is just pure raw energy and blood and fire everywhere. It is hell. And they call it hell. They don't call it any weird name, but it's just another alternate dimension. It's not an afterlife. You don't go there when you die. But if you die there, you get turned into a demon. Your soul, the energy from your body, your corporeal energy becomes a monster. You basically just automatically turn into that. You get transformed. So you don't go there when you die, though, if you're an Argent. Like, you just die in Argent, and then you can go to heaven. 
Aha. But here we fucking go. So that dimension is, again, another brilliant, it's almost like an SCP, another brilliant idea. It's an infectious dimension. So that dimension, if you open a gate to it, starts to bleed into your dimension and kind of take everything over. And suddenly you have like weird, you know, like, Ridley Scott alien or John Carpenter, the thing like growths everywhere and demons coming out of everywhere. And the hell has no intelligence. It's this screaming, crazy animal world, except they want to kill everything and spread. So of course they invade Argent. And of course the Argent warriors have to fight them. And the one human dude who is part of the Argent warriors is like you, doom guy, the protag, are like, these are the demons, rip and tear. They destroyed my world. There's epic battles in Argent. And then the Erdak are like, hey, you can't fucking invade our friend dimension and start fighting the demons. So now angels are fighting demons, but they're just different dimensions. They're not actual dualistic counterparts. They're, it's a total random coincidence that the light and clouds fluffy nice people are clashing with the chaos, fire and blood people. It's a coincidence bridged by this dimension Argent. Already again, again, like what a great idea. Like what a creative idea that the juxtaposition of hell and heaven were an accident. That's, that, that's a sort of decontextualizing postmodern take on monotheistic religion that you just don't see because it's so left of center. I'll never talk about Dune. It's too hard to talk about. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wrote an SCP. I wrote the one that's Tupac solving crimes from beyond the grave. Okay. It is Jack Kirby stuff. Okay. I want to talk about Doom uh, just a little bit more. I want to talk about Doom a tiny bit more, which is to say... So the Slayer got, so a thing happens in uh, between Erdak and Hell where these super advanced angels begin to be like, we need energy in heaven. And there's a lot of energy in Hell. And it makes even more energy when it processes souls. So the, eight, the angels figure out how to bleed energy from Hell. Except for in order to do that, they have to, essentially build a factory in hell that processes souls. Angels build hell in hell. They create a way for dead human souls to be sent to hell to be punished. And by punished, it just converted into demons. Hell was never a zone of punitive punishment. It's a fucking factory and you're getting sent there when you die, no matter what, because the Erdak found this other dimension, the earth dimension that has all these humans they can siphon and the Argentine people will never know. So the Argentine people are feeding off this energy created by human souls from an alternate dimension that the angels are putting directly into hell. So our idea of hell is wrong. There is no way to get into heaven. It's locked off by these angel aliens. Hell is the only place you can go. And there you will be converted into a demon and used to power a fucking Argentine cell phone. It's so cool. It's so fucking cool. So of course, Earth eventually finds this river of energy on a base on Mars, opens it, hell spills out onto the Earth dimension, and the Slayer is the only person who can stop it because he's the last person of the Argentine who wasn't corrupted by talking on their human soul-powered fucking cell phone. It's just like, oh my God, how clever is that? Heaven built hell? Heaven and hell are two rival alien civilizations that have nothing to do with Christianity? I mean, like, come on, come on. Am I mad at Anna Akana? I'm not mad at anybody. It's unproductive to be mad and it's unproductive to hold grudges um, because holding a grudge traps you in the mindset you were in when you got hurt. I find that to be true. Uh, if you, if something bad happens to you or something unfair, holding a grudge traps you in the mindset uh, in the mindset you were in when you were hurt. So whenever you see a person or think about a situation, you end up being like, instantly 
dragged back to how you felt in that moment. And yeah, I get dragged back to moments where I feel angry and, and, and hurtful. And like, I want, you know, well, I, I have lots of moments in my life that I like feel I was wronged, but I can't, I mean, it turned out okay. I'm alive in quarantine. I feel better about myself than I ever did before. No, hell is not Mars. Mars is a base by a company called the ARC uh, that you also used the hell energy to fuel Earth. Yeah, all of this tucked under a single player shooter. Brilliant. Okay, so what should we talk about now? Trank. Josh Trank's a cool guy. I hope he, uh, I hope that guy is doing well. People always ask me about like the same six things. Like I swear to God. Uh, I was thinking any left out ideas from the measures. Um, I'm happy with the measures for now. I never completed further. <laughs> Sorry, I got a funny email. Do I talk to Elijah? Sometimes I talk to everybody from my old life. Sometimes the people who were my friends, but it depends. Uh, here we go. My old life. What a weird way to say it. That came out. That was totally subconscious. Uh, RPC authority. No, too close. Okay. What do you do when life loses its meaning? Life never has a meaning. The game of life is that we assign meetings to it. We bring our own ball and bat to the game uh, in terms of existential meaning. You know, we, 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 yeah, meaning is something you make. That's exactly right. But that's not, tips on becoming confident. I don't know, do you have any for me? I, my confidence is a part of my bluss overbearing personality. Uh, I was on, I would be on trailers from hell if they asked me to, and no one's rushing to ask me to do anything right now. And also I'm not rushing to do anything. And also the entire nation is in quarantine and the future of capitalism is wholly uncertain day to day. So I'm not trying to like figure out my next career move. <laughs> Have I ever written a straight horror forward, uh, straightforward horror film? No. Uh, wait a minute. Didn't I have something else I was going to do? Oh yes. I have a bunch of questions about trust the police. Am I supposed to, to should I do that? I can't tell what I should do. Uh, Doom Eternal doesn't make me angry, it's so good. Doom Eternal, sometimes I encounter an idea where I'm like, oh man, I wish I thought of that. Oh, that's so brilliant. But then sometimes you encounter an idea that's so good that you can just be excited. I think my move, favorite movie of 2019 might have been Britney Runs the Marathon. <laughs> Is that weird to say? Is that a bad answer? I loved it. Okay, well, I feel like this was long enough. I didn't answer any of the questions about Trust the Police or Decon, but I did finally talk about Doom. What do I think of Carly Rae Jepsen's newest album? Is there a new, new one? Is there a new, new one? I know there was a new song that pretended to break the pattern, but didn't. Is there a new Carly Rae Jepsen album? Oh my God. Oh my God, oh my God, there's maybe a new Carly Rae Jepsen album. Why do you keep saying Knives Out sucked? Picking on Ryan Johnson is so like, don't do that. He's trying out there. Uh, Carly Rae Jepsen, Carly Rae Jepsen. No, just Let's Be Friends. Let's Be Friends was her new single. She, uh, it's a breakup song where she friend zones a guy. Oh my God, Carly Rae Jepsen doing a song about friend zoning. Oh, impossible. It's only one of the only things she sings about, except, except in this one, she's friend zoning him, except for she doesn't friend zone him. If you read the lyrics, he was there to friend zone her. So the chorus is a total illusion. Man you've ever seen, then I think you don't know many gay men. It's interesting. People have always, can I answer trust the police questions? Okay, we'll do that. And then I will get offline. I'll pitch you, okay. <laughs> I'll pitch you a movie, then I'll do that, and I'll get offline. I'm going to pitch you a movie right now. So there's this group of hackers, right? There's they They are bottom line hackers. They're brokers. Their main job is to correct for companies when stocks go up or down. Their job is to hack into the New York City Stock Exchange and to correct percentages on stocks just a little bit. So this guy and this girl are a couple, 
and they have a straight job. They're computer programmers. They're really, really functional and cute couple. They're thinking about having their first kid. She isn't sure. He's really excited, but they're sort of like thinking about starting a family. They're, they're sort of getting along better than ever. And you know what? They're ready. They're ready. But they are doing this illegal side business, almost like Breaking Bad, where they hack into the New York City Stock Exchange. And at one point, she reality checks him and she's like, hey, buddy, if we ever get caught during this, this is life in prison. We have cost people billions of dollars. And he's like, I know we only need to do it for one more month. He has a couple of little hacker friends and they all do it together. Okay. So one day they hack and they accidentally put a period in the wrong place. And by putting the period in a wrong place, they cost a company $100 million. So in the frantic rush to fix this, before people notice that this company that was doing well suddenly nosedived, they overcorrect and they make the company $500 million. Except the next day, the company is actually worth $500 million more dollars. And when they look in the news, there was all these big breakthroughs technologically at that company last night. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. They're the ones who changed the stock. It shouldn't be worth that. There shouldn't be news stories that go with it. It was a cheat code. But now they're interested, so they try changing the stock again. This is a TV show. This is the pilot. And this time, they change. They hack into their bank, and they change the money in their bank account. And it's really there. And it's tax deductible. They just gave themselves 70 bucks. So they give themselves $7 million in government bonds. And it just exists. This doesn't make sense. You can't hack the financial system this way. You can't create money in a computer. It doesn't make sense. You can create Bitcoin, but you can't create US dollar. And so they go, okay, so what should we try to do next? So they get into this big fight about it because they're taking too many risks. And they hack the United States Weather Service. And they say, tomorrow it's going to rain. And the next day it rains. Uh-oh. So the first season is one by one, the people in this hacker group go more and more crazy with the hacking until about episode three, the husband gets a phone call and disappears. So the wife is left, the wife is sort of our protagonist, is left fending off all of these hackers who can now go boop, boop, boop and alter their reality. And so she's fighting them off the whole first season, but then people keep dying or being murdered or disappearing. And she notices things and she can't fucking figure out like who's killing these other people until the finale of the first season, eight episode first season, 12 episode second season, when a guy in a black suit comes to her work looking for her and she barely gets away. Fuck, the CIA is on to them. But when she gets home, there's someone waiting. What if I told you it's fucking Morpheus? This is the Matrix TV show. They were hacking the Matrix from the inside. Her husband left and got unplugged in episode three. Ah, the second season is the Matrix TV show because the final moment of the first season is her taking the red pill. That's how I would do a Matrix TV show. Someone asked about the Matrix. That's what I wish. That's what I wish the Matrix TV show was. Um, and and but they're like they're not like Neo. They're like really normal. They're like a normal sweet couple. And that's my Matrix pitch. And you know what? My computer's dying. And and what's fun is they get to go back out into the real world. So in the second season, her and her husband are reunited and it's wonderful, except now they're in Zion and the real world's still all fucked up. They've like started to terraform after Matrix 3, but it's still all fucked up. And now guess what they're fighting about again? Do you want to have a baby in this world? And in the pilot, you know, they had a really big fight where it's like, I don't know about the environment. I don't know about the economy. How do you want to have a baby in this world? And then it's <laughs> In the first episode of the second season, when they're in the post-apocalyptic Zion world, they're having the same fight. In this world where robots run everything, and it's just because she doesn't want to have a baby. I don't know. I just, uh, I just, I don't know. I, I, I always loved that idea. I also always wanted to do Lord of the Rings with little Mexican-American girls in Los Angeles in 1993 during the LA riots. But that's another story. Uh, 
Okay. I had so much fun doing that. Kyle, everybody's content over style here is a guy named Kyle who's followed me for years and years. And he made a funny little short video called Dicks that I thought was funny and seemed like the first thing someone had made. And that's what it was, but it was funny and fun and good. Was that good, Kyle? Content over style. Shout out. Channel shout out. Content over style. Channel shout out. Oh, series shout out again. Villains too stupid to win and sci-fi uh, civil civilizations too stupid to exist. Thank you all for joining me on my stream. <laughs> the next time I do this, I will have more stuff planned and I will answer questions. Kyle, Kyle, God damn it. You fucking, you fucking, God damn it, Kyle. You fucking.